the African Campaign, the Signature Deluxe Edition. This is the Compass Games version of an old design, came out in the 70s. I haven't played the original the North African Campaign, uh, so I cannot compare them, but I played this one. I picked it up because I'm interested in the topic. I like games about uh, World War II and the North African Campaign in general. I like games that depict the event at the strategic level from the beginning, from the Italian disaster and then to the German reinforcements, do all that happens after that. But games of that type tend very often to be very complicated, very complex and very long to play. And this was seemed a game that uh, attempted to give you that portrait in a manageable, playable playable fashion and that alone was a big selling point for me. So I picked up the game and I played it, I played it solitaire, luckily enough it is also a game that is very friendly uh, for the solitaire player, it has no hidden information um, and it has enough randomness due to combat and other factors such as random fuel and random replacements for the Axis player, enough uh, uh, you know, predictable elements to make it fun and engaging even for the solitaire player who is playing both sides at the best of their possibilities. Without further ado, let's take a closer look at the African campaign. This is the map of the game. It is printed on paper and since this is a strategic simulation of the entire North African campaign in World War II, it is, as you can see, very long. Uh, and most of the operations will occur around along the coast. Uh, the two sides will rush in reinforcements from there and from there, trying to reach the most important areas of operations. Tobruk, of course, will receive a lot of attention, so you will have reinforcements that are running like crazy and then you will have most likely one main area of operations, one main fighting area. Sometimes with uh, units trying to outflank each other, sometimes you have multiple layers. I try to flank you from here or shoot you're trying to flank me there. Well let's see if I can do it here. Not to the point of course of forming up a vertical front that goes all the way to the bottom because at some point one of the two sides will manage to effectively outflank the other and when that side starts folding if there is any sense that is left in the player's melon that player will want to retreat, withdraw, move the front a little bit back and then start the whole rigmarole, the entire tango again because of course uh, blocking surrounding units of the opponent and preventing them from receiving supplies is a big element in this game also an effective way of destroying the opponent is to force the opponent to retreat but then to surround the opponent with also control and that will destroy the retreating enemy units is much more effective than to simply destroy units by punching them frontally if you can surround them and force them to retreat when they cannot. Other interesting elements are these ravines here. Movement wise units can enter a ravine in a turn or can exit a ravine, not both. So you could not from there go in here and then to the other side. The same turn, you get there, then you move maybe in the ravine and then you go pick a boot the next turn. But because of this, the time of the operations need to be well taken into account. There are also advantages in fighting in a ravine unless you are being attacked from a plateau, which is which are those areas inside the ravine. Um, the map is made on paper, it is really it is actually two maps uh, a, uh, that are adjacent to one another, overlapping one another. There you have the turn track with a lot of information about reinforcements, about air units that are available to support combat, reminders of when the German player, the Axis player, actually receives fuel. Table used for the Axis infantry replacement and fuel table. It's interesting that the game takes into account fuel shortage for the Axis. And Speaking about the turn track again, the game lasts 50 turns. That means that the length is not inconsiderable. True, you don't have many units on the board. It is a fairly low unit count. Uh, but still, even if each turn only takes 5 minutes, you multiply that by 50 and so again. That is still a fairly long session of play. Luckily enough, the game uh, can also be played solo, so you keep it set up if you don't feel like playing it at all the whole campaign in a single evening then you can easily break it down and then you go back to your basement game room the following evening or whenever. Um, also another thing is that 
Given the theme, given the theme, yes, 50 turns may feel like a lot, but most games that have this same topic and this scope last even longer. So there is, well, there is that to take into account. Now that we're looking at the map up close, I wanted to show you a nice touch, which is these signs here that simply count the access on the road starting from the edges of the map, which are where players are going to add most of the reinforcements. In a lot of North African games, you will spend a lot of time counting access as indeed the reinforcements from Tripoli or from Alexandria are trying to get as close as possible to the central layer of operations. So say I'm using strategic movement and all possible bonuses, then I know that this guy moves by 24. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, oh wait a second, was 16 or 17, ah, oh, I had to go back. As opposed to with these numbers, I am uh, on the pole with the number 20, I know I'm gonna move by 20 spaces, done. Very simple. This is somebody that has played North African games and has been bored by doing that reinforcement thing. And it's pretty typical but also very specific thing of this type of game. As for the military units, they are represented by these counters here. You have a symbol uh, in the middle of the counter, tells you what kind of unit that is, the color indicates the formation, and then we have two numbers here, combat and movement value. There is also a number of units that have two combat numbers, in which case the first is for the attack, the second for defense, but for most units the first number is using combat both in attack and defense. Units have a, have a different number of steps depending on well how strong the unit is, and units can have one, two, three, or four steps. For example, this is a four-step unit, which means it is represented by two counters. When the unit takes a hit, it is flipped to the side. When this side takes a hit, it is replaced by this other counter, representing the same unit at a different level of cohesion and strength, another hit, and then eliminated. These are nice counters. They are thick enough, they're sturdy, a little bit glossy, clean graphics. I like them. Even though for the fact, unfortunately, that some of them has been have been misprinted and so some don't have the back. So some units that have, say, three or four steps, so they look like they have only one. So you need to go online, look for the errata, and what's come to worse, you write in with the pen on the back of the counters the values while you're waiting for replacements to arrive from the publisher. I still have to contact the publisher to ask for, for the replacement counters. Anyways, so players will have their units on the board because if you don't have units on the board, what kind of gameplay, what kind of war game is this? So, uh, any count, when it comes to gameplay, the game is simplicity itself. It is really old school simple gaming. It's pretty much as simple as I go move and attack, you go move and attack with a couple of other phases around that, but this is pretty much how it is. An attack is classic combat odds. Pretty much if you want to go to the conclusions now, you know most of what you need to know about gameplay, especially if you're a seasoned war gamer. More in detail, in the standard game the ally player goes first each turn and then the Axis player goes, there is an optional rule that says that you can determine the order of each turn randomly, but usually the ally player will go, will receive reinforcements depending on the order of battle, depending on the schedule. Uh, for that for that turn. Sometimes the ally player has to withdraw units that are removed from the map, sometimes forever, well, until the last game I guess, sometimes until a later turn. After that is done, the ally player goes, the ally player moves, and when you move, you move up to the full movement allowance of your unit. Uh, different types of terrain will cost you different numbers of movement points, you have to stop when you enter an enemy zone of control, also you cannot move next turn from a zone of control to another zone of control directly, which really means that the defender, whoever that is, can play with, with the bottlenecks between the coast and the ravines quite a bit and make it harder for the opponent to surround them, to outflank them. But now we have a brave tank coming from this other direction, boom, and then later maybe we have another unit getting here, but now I was telling you about the 
multiple stacker sandwiches as lines try to outflank to outflank one another etc etc now this has been destroyed so now oopsie things are looking like I'm gonna get surrounded and I have to move back but this is the general idea so one side moves uh, stops uh, when entering uh, an enemy zone of control and then each unit of the active player must attack all units of the enemy that are adjacent to their own units. In this case, that would be quite a bit of attacks, and you can choose to split your attacks in different ways as long as you make sure that everybody gets attacked at least once. Here, I could have this person attacking this one, then this unit this one, and this unit this one, or maybe I can organize things differently, especially maybe with more units. Again, I declare the attacks and then I resolve them in any order I want and the order in which I resolve them is important. Combat is based on classic combat odds. You divide the total strength of the attacker by the strength of the defender you turn that into a, a different a proportion, one to two, one to one, two to one, and so on and so forth. That results into a column of the combat table. You roll a die and an intersection between the die roll and the column. You'll see the results, which may be attacker loses steps and has to retreat, defender loses steps and has to retreat, only steps to lose, only retreat, uh, only retreat for one of the two sides, eliminations. Pretty, pretty classic, pretty standard stuff. After the ally player has completed their turn following the system, the Axis player goes. The Axis player will get random reinforcements, uh, random replacements uh, as based on this table here. Something also that I like is that there is a track for the Axis player to keep track of how much fuel they have and that number will be replenished every other turn but on a random schedule you cannot store more than 10 fuel points pretty much every time that the axis player moves a unit by more than two movement points the axis player consumes a point of fuel when that is gone then all axis units can only move up to two movement points so it doesn't matter how much movement you have potentially if you don't have fuel to put in your tanks that's too bad for them they'll move only um, by spending no more than two movement points per movement and that is a very interesting very interesting limitation uh, also during combat uh, you can support combat with air supports their tokens represent simply extra points of strength represented by their support and players will receive them during the game based on the schedule printed on the turn on the turn track you have uh, minefields players may add minefields uh, there is a number of rent of tokens with different values of the minefields you shuffle them face down so when you place a minefield you yourself don't know how strong that is going to be how much damage is going to give to somebody entering that that hex and if giving a lot of damage or maybe even giving no damage and then you have other optional rules that you can add such as you know random events that sort of thing but the core engine the core idea is incredibly simple it is pretty much as simple as axis go um la player moves attacks axis players takes some hits and then moves and attacks also important of course you need lines of supply because given the topic threatening the enemy lines of supplies and having to worry about one's own line of supplies is very important but there's the general idea and victory of the game will be based on the different areas that the players have, have been able to conquer during the game of course each player is trying to get as close as possible to the home base of the opponent which is Tripoli for the allies and Alexandria for the Axis so the game has some errata but it is what it is unfortunately in war gaming maybe because it is still a little bit of a niche part of our hobby that is more common than in other styles of game and I'm gonna contact the publisher I forgot to do it before and I hope they send me the replacement counters because that is really the only thing that is annoying even if I were just to play with those counters with the number written in pen by me that doesn't make those counters particularly attractive but they're playable and the game is very playable in general the game plays well talking about gameplay 
also I don't know apart from those errata the components look pretty good they're they're nice components but gameplay is really nice it definitely is vintage it definitely has that whole school simplicity ah back to the times when most Roblox for war games had four to ten pages before things got really complicated which is not necessarily a bad thing you have a very complex games these days that are really fun it's worth getting into those putting in that effort but on the other hand it is also nice to switch gears from time to time and get to more simple approachable games that you can get into very easily and so also on top of that they also play smoothly because each turn is pretty simple it's pretty intuitive you do not have many procedures many steps to follow your attention can really be devoted mainly to what's happening there how to use your units how to exploit the possibilities given by the terrain how to deal with the challenges presented by terrain plateaus ravines lines of supplies constantly in peril that sort of thing you can really think about the strategy and i definitely like that i also like the fact that because of the large temporal scope that is covered by uh, by the game you really have a narrative, you really have an overarching situation that develops step after step. Now, if you play the game 20 times, maybe after a while that will start feeling a little bit scripted and, and repetitive because the Italians will get a big punch in the face at the beginning and they will have to retreat and hide and cry under a rock until the, the Germans come to help them and then the front moves a little bit back, then the Allies are exploiting lack of of supplies like of fuel on the axis side and so those different chapters of the saga are bound of course to come back in that order more or less in that way so on the plus side you had the fact that you see the architecture the historical event with a minimum of rules overhead you don't have to worry about much you simply place the units on the board based on the order of battle on the schedule of reinforcements and because of that a certain narrative a certain structure emerges of course because of that you may have a little bit of of redundancy but if you play a game 20 times heck you got you got your money back i mean you got your the your money uh you put it to good use that you don't get it back but you definitely uh they, they paid uh, your investment paid off is what i'm trying to say uh, speaking about repetitive, there is actually one little danger um, within a single game, not just over uh, a number of times that you play the game, which is that uh, precisely because of the simplicity of the turns, the straightforwardness, all strong points in my in my book. Uh, Precisely, however, uh, because you have such a simple structure and you repeat it 50 times, uh, at a certain point you may have, maybe around turn 25, 30, a little bit of a sense of redundancy, that you are repeating the same two, three things every time. I don't know, it could have been a way of compressing this a little bit more, make it into like 30 turns, for example. Uh, but again, especially if you're playing solo, then you take a break and the following day the game is just as fresh and exciting as it was before. Um, that, that may be a little bit of a price to pay, the fact that the, 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 the gameplay itself, turn after turn, feels a little bit repetitive simply because you have so many turns, more turns I believe than in, in most war games out there, you know, 15, 20 turns in many other in many other games um, but still again small price to pay I believe for a game that is very playable very manageable you can get into it without any effort you could use it to introduce a new war gamer uh, to this side of the hobby you can use it for yourself if you're a new war gamer this could definitely be a good place to start even if you never played a war game before this could be your first war game i think you'd be able to get into it and really enjoy it because actually um not only are the rules short but the strategy is both intuitive and non-obvious meaning i don't want to get surrounded i'm trying to surround you that is pretty intuitive and yet the way you implement it how you use your resources where you concentrate your forces where, you, where and when you risk stretching your front a little bit trying a little flanking maneuver all those things are non-obvious non-trivial while the main concepts are intuitive it is still fun to figure out ways of implementing them correctly or to say effectively which is of course what you uh, what makes a war game engaging when you have interesting problems uh, interesting dilemmas and outcomes that are uncertain and you decide how much you want to risk and where etc etc 
And that sense of like, well, a series of interesting problems is emphasized, is strengthened again by the fact that the, the game moves along in a very smooth way. And so you constantly have new things, constantly new people arrive. You don't have to count every single X. Boom, that's where it should be. That's 24 Xs where when I was before. I don't have to count it 24 times for each unit. That I, that's something that you may have done in previous North African campaigns. I remember doing that. It's annoying. We don't have to do it here. So overall, this is a good package, this is a good game. Again, maybe take a break in the middle, break it down into two sessions instead of like one single 50 turn session and then you won't have any problem. The game is definitely very enjoyable, very playable, uh, very manageable. So overall, I really enjoyed the North African campaign. Uh, it may not be the deepest game out there, but it's one of those games that is highly economic. For such a simple set of rules and such a relatively small number of units on the map, you have enough historical flavor uh, to keep you interested, to really give you the sense that you're not playing magnified chess, but a game about a specific event. You get a sense of the event, a sense of the flow of history, how things developed, and you have enough freedom there to experiment, to try to be the commander, to be, uh, to see if you can influence a story in one way or the other, while you see in any case, at the same time you're seeing the pool of how history went um, historically. I guess that sentence is a little bit awkward, but it kind of expresses what I wanted to say. So it's a fun game, it feels historical while remaining very playable and non-threatening. For all these reasons, I recommend the North African Campaign, a really good war game.